get to do this again because we have a full house. Um, welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. Thank you all for being here tonight. And it looks like, this feels like one of those church things where you have to squish in. I think we have one more seat up here. And over here, we're uh, we, you know, full house tonight. Thank you all for being here. Oh, two seats over there. Good. Um, thank you very much for being here tonight. We're thrilled that uh, we have such a wonderful turnout. We're very happy to see you here again. Um, the, those of you who have been here before understand the, the drill. We have a little housekeeping that we have to do, and one is uh, to fill in. We have to fill in this information, uh, your name, and, for, and how you heard about uh, the lecture tonight. And uh, we'd like to, if you don't mind filling all that stuff out, I know a lot of you is probably just an exam. Um, I normally tell you a little bit about the museum, just that we have, uh, uh, we are sustained by members and supporters, so if anyone's not a member and would like to be, we have the material at the front of the, the uh, museum. Uh, we also have some postcards that you're welcome to take with you, some of our models and different artifacts here. Um, today we have breaking news, we have a new t-shirt I want to show you because it just came in today, so in case you all need to buy a, you need a gift for your first mate, this is a perfect, perfect Valentine's gift. <laughs> Um, and also, we were very, very fortunate recipients of, in our new, in, in our, um, our extra room over here with the screen, we've been viewing a, a video that was made by the, on the history of the Houston Chip Channel. And so we also have the videotape, the, the DVDs, and the book. It's really interesting. It's the whole history of the Chip Channel, and it's all in our gift shop. So I normally don't do this, but I just had to tell you about all our exciting things. Anyway, because we have this incredible speaker here tonight, which we're very excited about, I don't want to delay the program, but I'd like to introduce Andrew, um, who I think, obviously you're all here because you know why he's here, so I think instead of my telling you a lot about Andrew, um, I'm going to just introduce him and ask him to please get started on his program tonight. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. Oh, no. oh. Oh, it on. Sound test, don't worry. We have speakers this time. Oh, it turns on. Uh, now it's on. Yeah. I, even I can hear that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would also like to extend uh, uh, to, the, to the staff of the, uh, the Houston Maritime Museum and the volunteers and the board. I would like to extend my thanks for inviting me to come back and, and talk to you, talk to the folks here. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for me. I would also like to recognize UTC as the sponsor of this lecture series. Uh, it's, a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for being able to, to be involved with that. I think I messed up the focus a little bit. Yeah. That's a little bit. Uh, is this is this uh, is this good for for purposes of videotape? Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm particularly thrilled and, and happy to be able to speak to you this month in February of 2015 because this month February is the sesquicentennial. It's the 150th anniversary of some of the more important things that happened in the Galveston area connected to blockade running during the Civil War. Specifically last week, there were several events that I'm going to talk about tonight. As many of you know, those of you who are from this area know that February is not the best time of year for weather on the Texas coast. Uh, this is Galveston. <laughs> this is Galveston at about 7.30 in the morning. This is Galveston about 7.30 in the morning yesterday. Uh, I took this picture on my, on my way into work, in fact, uh, yesterday morning. Um, and, and this is actually pretty common weather uh, on the Texas coast and in Galveston uh, during the winter time. Uh, we tend to get bound in by fog quite a bit. Uh, very heavy, very thick fog. Uh, makes things very difficult for mariners. That was the case in early February of 1865. Um, and we had actually three blockade runners that were wrecked on the Texas coast near Galveston in February of 1865. The first was Will the Wisp, 
which I'll talk about. I'll talk about all of these except the last one. Uh, Will the Wisp, which was wrecked on February, went aground on February 3rd of 1865. Two days later, the blockade runner Acadia went aground uh, just south of San Luis Pass in 1865. And the very next evening, February 6th, the blockade runner Wren went aground just off the eastern end of the city of Galveston. Um, both Will of the Wisp and the Acadia were destroyed in the process. The Wren escaped, got off, uh, was refloated, uh, and I'll talk about that uh, here in just a moment. <coughs> the Will of the Wisp is actually one of the more interesting vessels. Uh, it's one of the best known blockade runners of the American Civil War, not just because she ran the blockade once successfully in and out of Galveston and was wrecked on her last attempt to get in. Uh, but she actually ran the blockade into the port of Wilmington several times from Nassau. Will the Wisp is, is, no, is well known because of a book by the man uh, by the name of a book by the name of Running the Blockade by a man named Thomas Taylor. And Tom Taylor was he was not a mariner, he was not a ship's captain, uh, he was not a professional seaman. He was a clerk in a London shipping office for merchants who had a who had a financial interest in running the blockade and he was a bright energetic uh, young guy and so they sent him out to Nassau to take charge and oversee their blockade runners sort of act as a as an owner's representative that was what was called a supercargo he wasn't officially the owner he wasn't officially part of the crew but he represented the owners on board and was in that, empowered to conduct business for the ship and he ran the blockade in and out of uh, between Nassau and Wilmington several times on Will the Wisp. He found Will the Wisp to be an absolute lemon. He said that the ship was poorly put, put together. He said it was he said it was most fragile and terribly built. One of the things that's interesting about this is that Will the Wisp was launched in 1864 in Scotland. Will the Wisp was one of those ships that was actually built to run the blockade. And as such, it seems like her owners took a lot of shortcuts. Um, they, she, was built, she was built out of steel instead of iron, which is unusual. But the steel plates were extremely thin. Hull plates were an eighth of an inch or less. Extremely thin, very lightweight. But as, as Tom Taylor found out, the hull was not very rigid and it tended, to, it tended to torque a little bit and that ended up being a problem for them. Will the Wisp ran aground on February 3rd uh, in a fog uh, off of west on the Gulf Beach west of Galveston Island. Uh, she was bound by fog for several days during which time uh, there was a, a, a formal salvage party that was organized to try and recover the cargo, but the ship was actually sworn by soldiers and civilians who picked the thing clean over the space of about three or four days. They carried away everything that they could use or thought they could sell. And so by the time the fog lifted and the Union gunboat spotted her on the shore and sent in a boarding party to set her on fire, the, the officer in charge of the boarding party came back and said, we didn't even need to bother with this because the only thing that's left to burn are the wooden paddle boxes because the hull is full of sand and water. Everything has been picked completely clean. The decks are scuttled. They have, they have holes chopped in the decks to get at the cargo. We, did, we didn't even need to bother going in to destroy this thing because it's gone. It's destroyed. Will the Wisp was believed to have been found in the early 1980s uh, off the Galveston Beach, off the seawall at around 70th Street. We think now that that's probably a misidentification because after Hurricane Ike in September 2008, the land office, the Texas General Land Office, issued uh, contracts for survey companies to go in the Gulf and out and in the bays to locate and clean up hurricane storm wreckage. And in the process of doing that survey, they located this vessel, 
much further west, past the end of the Galveston seawall. Um, when they plotted the uh, when they plotted the, the length, it proved, turned out to be about 215 feet long, which is very close to the dimensions of uh, Will of the Wisp, and about 24 feet wide. This is a side scan sonar image. What you're looking at here is like a top-down view of the very bottom third or bottom quarter of the hull. As you can see, that's what the ship would look like intact. And this is what's left of what's left now. Um, I had the opportunity to, I worked with the Texas Historical Commission as a volunteer marine steward, and I had the opportunity to go out with the Historical Commission in the summer of 2009 and actually dive on this site, myself and several other marine stewards, along with the state marine archaeologist at the time, Steve Hoyt, and another marine archaeologist here on the right, Amy Morgans, who is now a state marine archaeologist. Um, we had the opportunity to dive on this wreck and take measurements, and we discovered that the, the, the dimensions of what was exposed on this wreck match very, very closely what we know the dimensions of uh, were for Will the Wisp. So we, we feel pretty confident that this, is, that this wreck discovered after Hurricane Ike in the winter of 2008-2009 is in fact Will the Wisp. Two days after Will of the Wisp went, around, went aground, it was time for the Acadia. Acadia was a very similar vessel, about, about the same size, a little over 200 feet long. Acadia was different because, in a couple of ways, Acadia was not built in the UK, like many of these late war blockade runners. Uh, Acadia was actually built in Canada. They didn't, in the 1860s, have a tradition of iron shipbuilding in Canada, and so Acadia was actually built of timber. But as far as we know, in hull form, she was very similar to the Irish Sea Steamers and the Clyde Steamers that, that, were, uh, that were being, like World of Wisp, that were being used for blockade running. The Acadia is a disastrous story. It's a comedy of errors, and the people, it, it, just about everything about this story indicates that the folks who were getting into blockade running, they were doing it at the very last minute, at the very end of the war, they were trying to make, they were trying to turn a quick profit, and they really had no business running the blockade. The reason I say that is that the, uh, the reason I say that is that um, when they went on, when they approached the Texas coast, uh, as I said, during this, this entire week, the coast was heavily bound in fog. The pilot that they had hired to guide them along the Texas coast couldn't get his bearings, and he just gave up. He threw up his hands and went below to his cabin. He said, I'm done with this. <laughs> Not good. Um, we don't know, we don't actually know where Acadia was trying to get into. Some sources say that Acadia was trying to get into the mouth of the Brazos River, um, and she's right now about 15 miles uh, east of the mouth of the Brazos River. If they were trying to get this vessel into the mouth of the Brazos River, they didn't know what they were doing because this thing is much bigger than would have been able to actually enter the river and get over the bar at that time. This vessel would have been tough getting into Galveston. Um, at that at that point, so sure enough, the, the 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 pilot says, "I'm done with this. Enough." According to some accounts, um, the uh, it was a wooden hull vessel, but the compasses had not been affixed on deck in proper binnacles, and the ship had not been swung after she was built, which is a process that they use to adjust the binnacles uh, for the magnetic compasses. And so the magnetic compasses that they had, I, I guess they were like boat compasses and little boxes on deck. Uh, those were unreliable as well. So no great surprise, Acadia ends up on the beach also. Um, Acadia was not, um, uh, Acadia was pretty far away from town, uh, was not actually salvaged. Uh, during, uh, was not heavily salvaged during the war. And uh, the next, a couple of days later, again, the fog lifts, she's sighted on shore and bombarded by 
by Union gunboats and set on fire. Some of the cargo that was salvaged ended up being auctioned here in Houston. Uh, and this is an article that appeared in the Galveston Weekly News. The upper part is kind of hard to read. Uh, but it says a portion of the goods were slightly damaged in getting them from the Acadia, while the balance were in good condition. The few dozen preserved fruits, it will be seen, brought from four to five hundred percent on first cost, while the necessary articles of iron brought but ten cents, but a trifle over actual cost, showing a proneness to indulge our appetites in preference to supplying the actual wants of the country. <laughs> this was consistently a problem during in blockade running. Keep in mind that blockade running was a private business venture. There were blockade runners that were operated by the Confederate government that carried nothing but military and government supplies. But blockade runners like Will the Wisp and Acadia, those were private ventures and much of their cargo was chosen by the shippers to be based on what they could turn the quickest profit on. And there were still enough people who were buying gold lace and silk shirts and preserved fruit, that that still made, made up part of the cargo. This is February of 1865. This is, at this point, at this point, Billy Sherman is having a camp out in Columbia, South Carolina, having marched to the sea and now is moving north through the Carolinas. This is about six weeks before Richmond falls and about seven weeks before Lee surrenders to Appomattox. The Confederacy is in extremis. The war in the East is winding down and blockade runners, they're still bringing in preserved fruits and gold lace and silk shirts. And something like that. A lot of the cargo that didn't get salvaged in 1865 was salvaged in the late 1960s in early 1970s by a man named Wendell Pierce. Pierce was a dentist here in Houston. He was very, I know, I know some folks um, uh, have, have heard of him. Uh, Pierce was a dentist. He was very interested in treasure hunting. He'd been all over the Caribbean. But the Acadia was a wreck that was right almost in his backyard. And he spent several years recovering materials from the Acadia and bringing them home and trying to preserve them as best he could. Um, a lot of those materials are now in the collection at the Brazoria County Museum down in Angleton. Um, eventually he had to he had to obtain a, to become in compliance with state law, he had to obtain a, an archaeological permit and have an actual archaeologist work on the project. Unfortunately, Dr. Pierce passed away very suddenly in, I think, 1973. And he never did compile, as far as we know, an actual site plan of the site. He spent years on weekends and holidays and stuff down there, diving by himself mostly. And he had worked out in his own mind exactly where everything was on the wreck and how the wreck was laid out and all the different features, but never got committed to paper. So unfortunately, we still don't, to this day, we've got lots of stuff, that, lots of materials um, that he recovered like hinges and door keys and locks and lanterns and fancy glass doorknobs and all sorts of stuff. We've got lots of stuff that was actually recovered from the wreck, but not actually a site plan of, of the ship, which would be tremendously useful um, in terms of archaeology and, and research. Anybody know what this thing is down here in the lower right? Ryan. Coffee grinder. Coffee grinder, uh, yeah, it kind of looks like that. It might help if I tell you the top of it is about this big around. That's exactly right. That's a flush toilet. And we don't actually we don't actually know for sure whether that was whether that was part of the ship's fittings out on the sponsons by the paddle wheels, uh, or that was actually part of the cargo. <laughs> no one ever no one ever gets that. The third blockade runner that went aground in February of 1865 was, was a blockade runner called the Wren. The Wren was one of two ships, the other was the Lark, 
and they were built to run the blockade at the Laird Shipyard at Birkenhead in the UK. I know someone else here knows Civil War ship that was built at Laird. Alabama. The Alabama, famous Confederate raider Alabama, was also built at Laird's, Laird Shipyard. The Wren and Lark were both built at Laird's late in the war. Both ran the blockade into Galveston. Uh, Wren, on the evening of February 6th, still in this fog, <coughs> ran aground here, about halfway between South Battery and Fort Magruder. Uh, if you go down to Galveston now and you drive out on the seawall in the east end and you look out and you see the, uh, the big condos that are built up there, that's about where the Wren was then. Sun came up the next morning, February 7th. The fog begins to lift. The Wren is spotted by the Union blockaders offshore. And they move in as close as they dare, because remember, there's still Confederate gun batteries out here. They move in as close as they dare and begin shelling the Wren. In the space of about four hours, they reportedly fired 103 rounds at the Wren. They hit with three. <laughs> All three of which reportedly passed right through the hull without, without doing any serious fatal damage. Well, as you can imagine, lots of people came out to see this stranded blockade runner uh, being fired on. Uh, General, uh, General Hawes, who's a Confederate commander here in, here in, uh, in Galveston, came out. Um, there were some volunteers. Uh, who came out from, from town to man the ship because during the night the crew had been working so hard to get off the get off the sandbar that they were just exhausted. So they took most of the crew off to let them rest and put, and put people from on shore on the vessel. Finally, about one o'clock in the afternoon, combination of working the, working the ship back and forth and the tide coming in, and, and who knows what. But they finally got the Wren refloated and brought the Wren around, uh, around the end of the island and up into the harbor. Um, her passenger, by the way, for those of you who are familiar with local Civil War history, one of her passengers coming from Havana was a man named Leon Smith. And Leon Smith was the in charge of organizing and commanding the naval side of the Confederate forces during the Battle of Galveston in January of 1863. Leon Smith didn't actually hold a commission in the Confederate Navy, um, and he tended to use whatever title worked best for him at the moment. So, so you'll see him as Commodore Smith, or Captain Smith, or Major Smith. Um, but in any event, he was he was a he happened to be a passenger on the Wren, and he actually got out on the Sponson and worked with the leadsman uh, to uh, to to help navigate the vessel uh, back into Galveston Harbor. Okay, the Federals at this point are really mad. 103 rounds. They did. Okay, they're determined to get the Wren. They really want this one because it was sitting right there and they got away. So that very night, February 7th, they organized a cutting out expedition. Cutting out expedition is a tradition in, in naval affairs. And it's what happens when you, when you organize a group of ships boats to go into an enemy harbor and steal one of their ships. It's a gutsy thing to do. So they organized uh, they organized a cutting out expedition from USS Princess Royal and from the flagship USS Bienville. And the cutters come in, they make first landfall of the Bolivar Peninsula, and then they steer southwest toward the harbor in command of, of an ensign by the name of George French. Initially, they encounter two Confederate schooners that are anchored off Fort Point. This is about where the ferry landing is on Galveston, by the way. Uh, they encounter two, anchor, two schooners loaded with cotton, ready to run out. And French figures, well, you know what? We are not going to be able to surprise is of the essence. We're not going to be able to get past these schooners 
uh, we're not going to be able to get past these schooners without being seen. So we need to take the schooners first. So they take they, the, the boarding parties go on board both of these schooners. They take them without incident. They capture both schooners. They capture 20 Confederate crew members on the two ships. And he organizes prize crews to sail them out through the channel and out to the Union fleet. He continues on and he tries to get into the harbor uh, to go aboard uh, and destroy the rim. For this purpose, he's been equipped with, among other things, five gallons of kerosene and a bundle of uh, a bundle of oakum to use as tinder, and six 32-pounder shells. And his instructions are to take these 32-pounder shells and put them in the boiler and around the engines, so that when the fire gets going real good, these these shells will cook off and wreck all the machinery. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, both the wind and the current are against him, and he and his crew spend the next four or five hours trying to get all the way down into the harbor. And finally, it's getting close to, to daylight. The next morning, the sun's going to be coming up, uh, and he, he says, we're, we're not going to be able to do this. And so he lets his crew rest on their oars, and they actually drift back out to the Union fleet. They didn't get, they never got their main objective, and the Wren eventually escaped. They didn't get their main objective, but their consolation prize was those two schooners loaded with cotton. Because the two schooners were eventually declared legitimate prizes. They were, they were both sent to New Orleans. They were adjudicated by a prize court. And the, two, the, the uh, crews of the two ships that sent boats on the on the cutting out expedition ended up splitting about eighteen thousand dollars between them based on the sale of the ships and, and the cut so it was not 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 bad not bad for a uh, not a bad haul for a for a long means work i got my story ahead of my slides that's bienville <laughs> Uh, and this is this is a this is a guard boat uh, like the uh, Federals used offshore to uh, patrol at night um, to help spread their spread their uh, uh, eyes, I guess you might say, uh, for blockade runners running in and out. So how did we get to this spot? Well, as you know, in December of 1860. Uh, South Carolina seceded three, three and a half, a little over three years before. South Carolina seceded from the Union, declared we're no longer part of the United States. Several other states in the Deep South tier, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and Florida, followed suit. So by February of 1861, we're going back now four years, by February of 1861, that whole lower tier of the South had seceded. And everybody was focused on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Fort Sumter was a man-made fort. It was occupied by man, an U.S. Army officer by the name of Robert Anderson, uh, and his troops were holding out at Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter was symbolic of Union authority, United States authority in South Carolina. And it was a raw sore that really, really bothered the secessionists because they couldn't get some, they couldn't get Anderson and his troops out. Finally, on April 12th of 1861, a little over a month after Lincoln assumed presidency, Confederates opened fire on Fort Sumter. They bombarded Fort Sumter for 36 hours. Eventually, Robert Anderson had to capitulate. Things moved very quickly after that. Uh, Anderson capitulated uh, on, on April 13th. He formally surrendered, I think, on April 14th. On April 15th, President Lincoln put out a call for volunteers from the northern states to suppress the rebellion in the south. 
That was April 15th. April 17th, Virginia, which had been teetering on whether or not to secede, Virginia finally formally seceded from the Union. Excuse me, Virginia would go on to become the most important prominent Confederate state, uh, arguably. After Texas, of course. <laughs> but something else really important happened on April 17th that sometimes is forgotten about. Everybody thinks, oh well, Virginia seceded and that was, that, that was important. But something really important happened in terms of naval events on April 17th. And that is that the con new Confederate government under Jefferson Davis publicly put out a call for privateers to operate against U.S. shipping. Privateers had a long history um, in the West. Privateers are privately owned, privately equipped, privately crewed vessels that receive a license from a government to go out and capture, take prizes, and destroy enemy shipping. Privateering had been outlawed in 1856 in the Treaty of Paris, signed by the French, signed by the Russians, signed by the British, not signed by the U.S. Because the United States up to that point had always been a weaker naval power and privateering was a tool, very effective tool, that the United States, first the 13 colonies during the Revolution and then the United States during the War of 1812 had used. So the United States never signed this treaty outlawing privateering. But it's still an important event because privateering was recognized, calling for privateers was recognized as an act of war. Universally, internationally recognized as a belligerent act of war. And that gave the Lincoln, that was on April 17th, that gave the Lincoln administration, that opened the door for them to declare a blockade of southern ports on April 19th. Action, reaction. And so that's why the blockade came about and was formally declared on April 19th. The United States, by the way, did not sign the Treaty of Paris until later, but they sent notification to, uh, through diplomatic channels to the French and the British that the United States was not going to engage in privateering, and they didn't. So in effect, for, for all intents and purposes, the U.S. government followed the Treaty of Paris while the Confederates didn't. The Confederates did organize some privateers, but they weren't terribly effective. In Galveston, as in other places in the South, the arrival of the war was greeted with great fanfare, lots of excitement. Um, because, it'll, because, of course, you know, it'll all be over in six months and the boys will be home by Christmas, right? <laughs> Sort of the epicenter of Galveston at that time was this building, the Henley Building. It still stands. It's currently under renovation. It's on the corner of 20th and Strand in Galveston. Still looks pretty much like that, actually. Uh, but you'll notice that up at the very top, one thing that doesn't exist anymore is there was a cupola on top of the building. And that was designated as an official lookout. Henley Building was one of the tallest buildings in Galveston and it had a clear view of the harbor to the, or the harbor of Galveston Bay to the north, the east end of the island, and the Gulf of Mexico to the, to the, to the east and south. And so very quickly, lookouts were organized uh, for the top of the Henley Building. And they had a marvelous time. They had a wonderful time. They had volunteers and they collect people donated telescopes and binoculars and looking glasses and they set up a flagpole and they developed a flag code so that they could put up flags that would tell people in town what, what they had cited and they put up things all over town that explained what the code was so people could read the code and when they got bored with that they organized raiding parties that would go to merchants along the strand and capture prizes uh, <laughs> like boxes of cigars and water coolers and all the stuff and all the stuff to make a lookout's life more comfortable up on top of the Henley building. It even became popular for a while for visitors in the evening, civilians, to come up to the top of the Hindley building and get a tour and look through the telescope. A friend of mine who lives in Austin 
researcher by the name of Richard Eisenhower, who I have known since the fourth grade, and it makes me really annoying because I look my age and he doesn't. <laughs> But Richard actually found, just before, just when I was finishing the book, he emailed me and said, have you ever seen one of these down in the lower right? And I said, no, Richard, what's that? He said, this is a card I found on eBay. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a souvenir from Henley's Lookout from the beginning of the Civil War. And if you notice, it even has the latitude and longitude of the Henley Building printed on it. It's now in the, uh, well, you're right, it does have the American flag. The only thing I can figure is that they wanted something patriotic, and it was the very beginning of the war, and that's what they had available as, as an advertiser's cut for the print, at the printing shop. So that ended up in the book. It's the first, it's, I think, the first time it's ever been published, and that card is now in the collection at Rosenberg Library. All of that took place in the spring and early summer of 1861. Things got real in July of 1861 with the arrival of the USS South Carolina. South Carolina was one of the first merchant ships that was bought into the Union Navy and fitted out with guns and sent out on the blockade. South Carolina arrived off Galveston in early uh, July of 1861. Her captain, James Alden, Sent, in, sent a formal notice into Galveston saying, you are now officially under blockade. And then he spent the next three days snapping up little small schooners trying to run in and out. I think he captured six or eight of them in the space of three days. Then for July 4th, he took all of their captured crews and gave them a fantastic, wonderful dinner in honor of the 4th of July to remind them about their uh, to remind them about their role as loyal American citizens and then he put them on a boat and sent them into Galveston. Their thing stood for about a month until early August and that was when the Confederate batteries first opened fire on one of Captain Alden's little schooners that he had kept as a tender. Captain Alden responded by bringing the South Carolina close in shore. That's what's shown in this image, South Carolina uh, exchanging fire with the gun batteries. You notice, you know how I told you earlier that they had fired 103 shots at the Wren and only hit, missed almost every one? Well, gunnery, at least on the Texas coast, gunnery was uniformly terrible through the entire war. <laughs> Confederate batteries never hit the South Carolina during this action. <laughs> South Carolina didn't hit the Confederate batteries either. <laughs> the problem was when the Confederates were firing at the South Carolina, their shells went out into the Gulf somewhere. When the South Carolina fired at the Confederate batteries and the shells went over, they went into town. <laughs> and it flattened several houses, blew up buildings. Um, it, it blew up one unfortunate guy who happened to be standing in the wrong spot, and I'm, I'm not sure they ever found all of him. Um, and that sort of, that in August of 1861, that was when the war got real on the Texas coast. That was when the first blood was drawn, and that was, uh, uh, that was sort of a watershed moment. Early in the war, for the first three years of the war, most of the blockade running that was done in, on the Texas coast was done by sailing vessels, by small schooners that could get in and out of Galveston easily. They could get in and out of Sabine Pass or San Luis Pass or any number of small inlets along the Texas coast. And they were very, very difficult to, to capture. Um, and the success rate during the early part of the war, even for these sailing vessels that were dependent on the wind, their success rate was somewhere around 90%. Almost all of them got through. Um, of course, the more you run in and out of blockade, eventually those statistics catch up with you. But on any given run, they had a very good chance of getting through. When I wrote the book, I included a story about a man named Dave McCluskey. I included, and I'm about to tell that story now. I included it because it was an exciting story, it was a fun story. 
but it's just another anecdote. This will fit perfectly in the book. Boom, three paragraphs done. I was at book signing last summer, and some very nice folks came up to me, and they said, you wrote about Dave McCluskey. I said, yeah, he's in there. And they said, my wife here is his great-great-granddaughter. <laughs> That's wonderful. You must know all about him. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but it was wonderful that they did that because now I do know all about it <laughs> because they got me interested. Now Dave McCluskey was a Scotsman. He wasn't from Texas. He wasn't from the United States. He was born. He was he was a Clyde, he was a, he was a Clyde signer. He was born on the Clyde. Uh, not far from Glasgow. He came to Texas around uh, he came to Texas around 1845 uh, when he was around 15 years old. We don't know exactly how he came to be here, but er, but very early on he was he was active as a mariner and was running his own boats, his own his own vessels. I never found a picture of Dave McCluskey, so I was trying to think what what would this Scotsman what would he have looked like? I need something to help me imagine what he looked like. And at first I tried turning to popular culture. And so I started with Mike Myers. <laughs> One of those movies, I thought, no, that's, 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 not, that's not the type of Scotsman I want. We need something more heroic. And so I ended up with Mel Gibson as William Wallace from Braveheart. Now, if you know the story of William Wallace, you know that that doesn't end well. Yeah. I thought, okay, I need something a little bit more lighthearted. What else can I go with? And so that then I ended up with groundskeeper Willie from the Simpsons. <laughs> okay, none of those work. None of work. Dave McCluskey was not any of those guys. I did, however, finally find a picture that I like to think of as Dave McCluskey. This is an illustration of a, of a Confederate blockade runner, a privateer, and I like this image for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that he's carrying a lantern. <coughs> Most of these guys, they ran in and out at night for obvious reasons, because they didn't want to be seen. The next thing is he's wearing civilian clothes, and for the most part, Blockade running was a civilian activity. There were civilian mariners, not naval officers, not military personnel. It was a civilian activity. It was a commercial enterprise. Now you'll notice that he's carrying a pistol in his hand. I believe that's a Colt, in fact. He's carrying a pistol in his hand. Now that's a little bit unusual because blockade runners were not, ships running the blockade were not armed. They might have hundreds or thousands of rifles down below in the hold, but they weren't actually armed and they usually did not put up a fight. Dave McCluskey was an exception. <laughs> and so I like to think that that pistol in his hand is the pistol that he relieved the Union Naval officer of in the story I'm about to tell you. Uh, we've already done that. And we've already done that. Uh, this is this is. But then, by the way, this is a story from uh, 1857 where McCluskey took his schooner. There was another vessel that was stranded on the breakers at Galveston on the bar, and was actually being knocked to pieces by the surf over the breakers. And he took his own schooner out and saved the eight people who were on that stranded vessel. And they almost certainly would have been lost, lost their lives without Captain Dave. And that's even before the war. So, pretty gutsy guy. Okay, so now it's the spring of 1864, and we're in Havana. And another blockade, another man, another Scotsman who has been running the blockade, a man named William Watson, uh, he's been running the blockade into Texas under sail. He runs into his old friend, Dave McCluskey, in Havana. And Dave McCluskey says, I can't do the Scottish accent, I'm not even going to try. But McCluskey says, Bill, come with me down to the harbor. You've got to see my new ship. You've got to see my new schooner. So they go down to the harbor, 
And Dave McCluskey says, here it is. <laughs> and William Watson says, that's a scow. And Captain Dave says, but it was only $500. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a barge that we used to bring timber down from the Trinity River. I put a centerboard in it and, and, and mass and rigged it with mass and, 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 I, and, I, and I sailed it loaded with cotton all the way to Havana. <laughs> and, Captain, and, and, Cap, and William Watson says, it's a scow. <laughs> and Captain Dave, being the Scotsman, knowing, knowing what a Scotsman wanted, he said, but it was only $500. <laughs> so they said, okay, tell you what, you're about ready to sail for the Texas coast. I'm about ready to sail for the Texas coast. We'll leave tomorrow together and we'll see how we each do. So they both sail the next day. They spend the afternoon sailing along the Cuban coast, the North Cuban coast, sailing to the westward. It gets dark. Of course they run without lights. So by next morning they're separated. They don't know where, where they are. William Watson runs his schooner, the Rob Roy, into Galveston. And so while he's in Galveston, a few weeks later, who does he see? He sees, runs into Dave McCluskey, probably down there on the strand. <laughs> And he says, well, Dave, what happened? And Captain McCluskey says, have I got a story for you. <laughs> this is a reconstruction of what we think, of, of, of what we think his, his schooner looked like. When Captain Dave, his schooner was named the Stingray. Barge schooner. <laughs> um, schooners being generous. All right. When he was off the mouth of the Brazos, his schooner was captured by this vessel, the USS Caneo. Federal gunboats stationed off the Brazos River to intercept schooners like Stingray. In chasing down Stingray, Caneo had gotten off station. And so her captain wanted to return to his assigned spot off the mouth of the river. So he put a prize crew on board and he said, all right, you guys follow me you, you take care, you, you secure the prisoners, and you follow me back to, back to our station. So they do. And they put Captain Dave, they take Captain Dave and the crew, and they take, gather up their personal stuff, carpet bags and stuff like that, and they throw them in the boat they're towing along the stern. And they're following along. Captain Dave and his crew get put off down in the hold of his schooner. You can imagine Captain Dave's not happy about this. So the officer in charge, an acting ensign, we'll get to it in a moment, he goes down into Captain Dave's cabin and he's looking through the papers, the ship's papers, he's looking for stuff, incriminating evidence, because they're going to send the schooner to a prize court. They need evidence that he's running the blockade. So while the officer is down poking around in the cabin, Captain Dave is talking to the sailors who are standing guard on deck. And he says, you know, they have some fine, fine liquor in Havana. And we have some right here. <laughs> Just a little taste won't hurt. You see where this is going. <laughs> well, sure enough, these sailors who maybe hadn't had much alcohol in a long time, their taste for alcohol overpowered their sense of duty and common sense. And pretty soon, they were thoroughly sloshed. A couple of them were sleeping it off on deck. The ensign comes up from Captain Dave's cabin, sees what's going on, and Captain Dave grabs him, relieves him of his pistol, you know this happened because you saw it in the picture, right? <laughs> Relieves him of his pistol, pushes him off down into the hold. One of the Union sailors who's been asleep on deck, he's awakened by the commotion. He tries to get up. He falls overboard. <laughs> Captain Dave takes a spar and throws the spar off into the water so the guy won't, he'll have something to hold on to so he won't drown. One of the other Union crewmen hightails it back for the boat they're towing the stern, and he cuts the painter and drifts off, and, and drifts off. 
and Captain Dave turns the bow straight for the beach. Several minutes before the officers aboard Kenia realize what's going on, they turn and give chase, but by then it's too late. Captain Dave is too far away. He runs up into the shallows where Kaneo can't, it's too shallow for Kaneo to follow. And he runs his schooner slash barge <laughs> very gently up on the sand. And a troop of Confederate cavalry come riding up over the dunes to discourage a Union landing party from following. Captain Dave got his schooner back and he ended up with five Union prisoners. <laughs> and the captain of Keneal had a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> so that's how Captain Dave got his schooner back. Um, postscript to this, um, a couple weeks later, Captain Dave went out, went, he, he, after he got to Galveston, he went out on a board of truce boat uh, to the Union fleet off of Galveston. There were boats that went out pretty regularly with various communications under flag of truce, and no one could interfere with people who came out on the truce boat. Captain Dave comes out to the Union fleet and introduces himself and says, yeah, we know who you are. <laughs> and he says, well, he says, uh, I'm here, and you know, we've got your guy, and we need to, uh, I'm, I'm here to pick up his personal gear because it will, it will make his life a little bit easier when they send him to Camp Gross up near Hempstead. Uh, and so they give him that, and he says, oh, and by the way, can I have my stuff too? Because that was already in the boat. <laughs> He says, no, and they say, no. And, he's, and Captain Dave says, well, you know, I was really, really good to your guys. I was really good to your I, We treated them very well. That was very expensive liquor we gave them. And you should show a little more appreciation for what we did for your people. I know that Captain Dave was enjoying this because he was yanking their chain on the Union Commodore's own quarter deck and they couldn't lay a finger on it. <laughs> he never, he never, by the way, he never got his bags back. But I'm sure he thought it was worth it. Uh, Captain Dave uh, held a variety of offices in Galveston in the years after. He passed away in April of 1877, almost 23 years to the day after he, after this incident. Uh, aboard his schooner, and he's buried in the cemetery on Broadway. Very quickly, uh, and a month ago I would not have been able, uh, a month or six weeks ago, I would not have been able to talk about this. This man is Paul Burner, and he was a Union Naval officer on the Gulf Blockade in 1864. He was the boarding officer on board Stingray. He was the one who was poking down around in the captain's cabin looking for stuff while his sailors were getting drunk. And he was the one who ended up having to go to Camp Gross for six months before he got it, up near Hempstead uh, prison camp, before he got exchanged. This is a photograph that I happened to find on eBay over the New Year's break. And I managed to get it. It's now in the collection at uh, uh, Rosenberg Library in Galveston. But I've never seen a picture of him before. Uh, he also, like Captain Dave, Captain Dave was a Scottish immigrant. Paul Burner was a Prussian immigrant. Uh, he was born in Breslau, Prussia, which is now in Poland. Uh, and he had actually become a naturalized U.S. citizen only as recently as 1860. And a year later, he joined the Union Navy. <coughs> Where is he buried? He is buried, uh, he, uh, he lived in, apart from his military service, he lived, as far as I can tell, he lived in New York City his entire life, and he passed away there in 1911, and he's buried in Cypress Hills, and he's buried in Cypress Hills Cemetery in Brooklyn, uh, National Cemetery in Brooklyn. One of the other, just very briefly, one of the other interesting things about Paul Burner case file, if, if any of you have access to Fold3, which is a subscription service that has military records, uh, Paul Burner's pension file is 50-something pages long. 
Uh, it's a very long, very, very complex file. And one of the things in it is a copy of his honorable discharge from January of 1866. And about a year after his death, he died in 1911, about a year after his death, the former commander of his Grand Army of the Republic post, the Grand Army of the Republic was, a, was an organization for Union veterans, the former commander of his GAR post was going through a bunch of old papers and found Paul Berner's discharge. And he knew that Berner had passed away. Berner left no widow, he left no children, he left no family. And this former GAR commander didn't know what to do with it, so he sent it into the Navy. And it ended up in his files, in Berner's files, in the National Archives. And it's actually signed by Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy. So that was kind of a cool find. By 1864, early 1865, there were 12 or more Union warships off Galveston all the time, 24 hours a day. That includes gunboats and supply vessels running back and forth. Um, this is an image that was actually drawn by someone in Galveston sketching out all the Union warships offshore. Uh, and you'll notice that they're all numbered. Unfortunately, if there was ever a key that identified which ones they are, that's been lost. Uh, but this is also down in, in Rosenberg Library. Um, several well-known blockade runners came into Galveston. Probably the most famous was John Newman Moffat. Or uh, he's very well known for, running the, for, uh, for being commander of the Confederate Raider Florida, but late in the war in 1865, he ran the blockade runner out, excuse me, owl into Galveston. I won't tell that whole story, but it's a story very similar to that of the Wren, with the exception that he got grounded on the shoal and they got his ship off and into the harbor before daylight, and the Federals never actually knew he was there. Finally, who recognizes that house on the left? McLean. Say it? That's uh, Appomattox. That's right. That's the Wilmer McLean House at Appomattox. Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. And most people, if you ask, well, when did the Civil War end? They'll point to that house and they'll say, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant signed Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to Ulysses S. Grant in the front parlor of that house in Virginia on April 9th of 1865. And that's true, but it's not the end of the war. The Confederate government never surrendered, and there were Confederate units all over North America that surrendered in ones and twos and bits and pieces. There was the famous Confederate raider Shenandoah that showed up months later in Liverpool, having learned having learned that the that the war was over. Um, the Shenandoah's commander decided he would take a ship all the way back to England rather than surrender to U.S. authorities. For my money, though, the American Civil War ended right here. This is a ship called the USS Fort Jackson. And Fort Jackson was the flagship of Commodore Benjamin F. Sands. And he commanded the Union, he commanded the division of the West Gulf Blockading Squadron stationed off of Galveston. And on June 2nd, almost two months after Appomattox, on June 2nd of 1865, General Kirby Smith, the commander of the Confederate Trans-Mississippi Department, which covered the entire Confederacy west of the Mississippi, Arkansas, parts of Louisiana, Texas, Indian Territory. Kirby Smith and John Bankhead Magruder went out and boarded Fort USS Fort Jackson and in Captain Sand's cabin formally surrendered the Confederate Trans Mississippi Department. It was the largest, it was the last major Confederate command to surrender during the entire war. And for my money, the Civil War didn't end here. It ended here 
about a mile off the beach at Galveston. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for being indulgent and letting me go a little bit longer than I should have. I apologize for that. I, I think there are probably some questions. So I would, you, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Uh, what role did Commander uh, Frederick uh, Croker of the Battle of Sabine Pass have to do with the bouquet runners? Uh, the Battle of Sabine Pass is, is actually tremendously important. Um, the I can't speak to Croker specifically. The Battle of Sabine Pass is tremendously important. Um, my, my friend and colleague at Cotton was talking about this just the other day. Um, in 1863, there were a whole series of events that really did shape the war in the western Gulf of Mexico. The first was the recapture of Galveston on January 1st of 1863. Galveston was intended to be a staging area, a logistics point, a landing point for a major federal invasion of Texas. That got put on hold when, get, when Confederates recaptured Galveston. Their initial reaction was to send a flotilla under Commodore Bell to retake Galveston. And they were prepared to do that. They were, they were almost to the point that they were going to do that on January 11th of 1863, 10 days later, when the Confederate raider Alabama showed up and sank one of their gunboats, the USS Hatteras. That same month, Confederate gunboats came out from Sabine Pass and captured two small Union vessels. Then in September of 1863, um, there was another invasion fleet that was going to come up through Sabine Pass, and that was turned around by Dick Dowling and his troops from Houston in the Battle of Sabine Pass in September of 63. And after that, the Union gave up trying to invade Texas from, from the water. And they ended up trying to do it by way of the Red River, which was its own, its own problems. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, speaking of Dick Dowling and his artillerymen, you were talking about the uniformly bad guttery during the Civil no. War. Battle of Sabine Pass was the one exception to that because those guys had been practicing for about six months. They had any stage and their fire was absolutely deadly. Mark, you are absolutely right and I apologize and Dick Dowling is going to haunt me in my dreams for, ha for having said that. Thank you. You are you're absolutely right about that. That was the one exception and the reason they were there was because they didn't want those Irishmen near Houston or Galveston. <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. Adam Wheeler, you guys were the blockade runners. How fast did they go? The blockade runners, how fast could they go? I apologize if I've hurt anybody's hearing because I, I sometimes I, I'm not used to wearing a microphone and sometimes I talk a little loud and I apologize about that. Um, the How fast could the blockade runners go? Um, typically um, for short bursts they could do anywhere between 14 and 17 knots, um, which was quite fast for that time period. Um, I know one of the most successful blockade runners uh, on the Gulf Coast, first at Mobile and then at Galveston, was a ship I haven't talked about tonight, which was the Denby. And the Denby could only do about eight knots. Um, but Farragut and his flag captain, Percival Drayton, uh, they spent a lot of sleepless nights worrying about the Denby, and they re reported that the Denby's success was not because of her speed, but because her captain was smart and, and, and was, was clever, was more clever than fast. Are the steamers? Were they all side wheel? Because I didn't see side wheels on some of the pictures. They, they were not. They were some of the some of the blockade runners had uh, used screws. Um, side wheel more often than not. The blockade runners were side wheelers, and very often the there was a, I think a higher proportion of, of screw vessels uh, among the blockading fleet. But there were there were both on both sides. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I think your books are going to be on sale after, uh, on our way out.
out if you want to pick up. Yes, I have. All the way in the back. I have uh, my book, Blockade Running on the Texas Coast. Uh, I, I'm going to have those in in the in the in the room at the front of the museum. Marine room. So go straight back. Go past the north wind, and it's right there. Uh, they'll be they're they're twenty dollars or two for thirty five, and uh, uh, and I, I can take I can take check or cash. I'm sorry, I'm not set up to take plastic. But so I'll have those. I'll be happy to sign as many of those as you like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, I didn't come up. Darn low. How are you, sir? Last time we had cotton down. Yes. Yes. Before that, I was dropped right here. I'm when you open it. Yeah. That's what that's. That's been 25 years ago. Uh -huh. Right, 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 right. It has good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.